Welcome to conference coverage presented by ReachMD Radio on XM160 and powered by Health Day, featuring the latest clinical information and research findings from Digestive Disease Week 2010, which took place May 1st through the 5th in New Orleans. I'm your host, Dr. Markina. And I'm Sue Berg. This year's conference attracted approximately 15,000 attendees from around the world and focused on the latest research in gastroenterology management, endoscopy and surgery, as well as hepatology. Key highlights included advances in surgical and medical management of inflammatory bowel disease, including Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, colorectal cancer, and liver disease. In addition, presentations focused on the incidence of pediatric hepatitis C virus, discovery of a targeted antibiotic for irritable bowel syndrome, and factors contributing to pediatric irritable bowel disease. At the meeting, an update was presented from the ongoing Pregnancy and Inflammatory Bowel Disease and Neonatal Outcomes Registry. Researchers found that women prescribed inflammatory bowel disease medication during pregnancy may not experience adverse pregnancy outcomes. The researchers evaluated the impact of IBD medication exposure in utero on newborn development in the first year of life. 605 women have been enrolled in the registry so far. About 400 had completed their pregnancy. Researchers ascertained IBD medications and disease activity in the women during gestation, as well as complications of pregnancy and delivery and developmental indicators in infants at 4, 9, and 12 months of age. Patients exposed to azathioprine or biologic drugs infliximab, adalimumab, or sirtilizumab did not have an increased risk of pregnancy-related adverse events. However, there seemed to be a trend toward increased neonatal intensive care unit stays, with a more than twofold increased risk among patients exposed to biologics. While this risk may be clinically significant, it's not statistically significant. There also appeared to be a trend toward preterm births and those exposed to biologics. According to researchers, this study is not only evaluating the safety of drug use in pregnancy in women with IBD, it will also be prospectively following women and offspring after birth for four years. At nine months old, researchers found that offspring whose mothers took azathioprine during pregnancy were at an increased risk of not reaching all developmental milestones. Pediatricians should be aware that these children may be at increased risk of developmental delay and monitor them closely. One author of the study disclosed serving as a consultant and an advisory board member for multiple pharmaceutical companies, including manufacturers of drugs used in this study. Two separate trials designed by researchers at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles demonstrated that rifaximin provides relief for symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome in patients who are taking the drug. In addition, rifaximin appears to continue to provide relief for an extended period after patients stop taking it. The researchers randomized more than 1,200 IBS patients with mild to moderate diarrhea and bloating to 550 milligrams of the antibiotic rifaximin or placebo three times a day for two weeks. They then followed the patients for an additional 10 weeks. Rifaximin provided relief of IBS symptoms, including bloating and abdominal pain, while patients were taking the drug, as well as over the 10-week follow-up period. The results of the study provided further evidence suggesting IBS may be caused by an overgrowth of bacteria in the gut. The study was funded by Salix Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, which markets rifaximin. One author disclosed financial ties to the company. The same author discovered the use of rifaximin for IBS. Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, where the trials were designed, holds the patent rights to this discovery, which it has licensed to Salix. Researchers at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada, found that infants prescribed antibiotics in the first year of life may be more likely to develop pediatric inflammatory bowel disease than those not exposed to antibiotics. The researchers identified children younger than 11 years of age diagnosed with IBD between fiscal year 1996-1997 and 2006-2007 using the University of Manitoba IBD Epidemiological Database. A total of 24 cases and 240 controls met eligibility criteria. Of these, 79% had Crohn's disease and 21% had ulcerative colitis. Overall, the average age at diagnosis was about six and a half years old. Children with inflammatory bowel disease averaged a little over two antibiotic dispensations in their first year of life. Controls averaged less than one dispensation. For children receiving antibiotics, 49% of cases were for otitis media. Those receiving antibiotics once or more during their first year of life were at greater than five times the risk of being diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease by the age of 10 compared to those who received no antibiotics. 
The authors say that further study is needed to make a convincing case that, first, the link between antibiotic use and pediatric IBD is not a spurious one. Secondly, if this link were proven to be robust, other types of studies need to be conducted to prove causality if it exists. In another study, researchers at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, found that the polyp detection rate does not decrease during the day among endoscopists who work a shorter daily work shift schedule. Previous studies had shown that overall polyp detection rates steadily decrease throughout the day. Endoscopists at the Mayo Clinic work uniquely in that they are scheduled in three-hour shifts three times a day rather than a half-day or full day. Data from nearly 4,000 colonoscopies at the Mayo Clinic were analyzed. Factors known to influence the rate of polyp detection, like incomplete patient preparation, were excluded. The researchers show that for these endoscopists, polyp detection rate was 39.1% during the first shift of the day. During the midday shift, the rate was 44.6%, and during the late shift, polyp detection rate was 38.9%. Withdrawal time was shown to be stable throughout the day. The author said in a statement that with shorter shifts throughout the day, a drop in polyp detection rate later in the day was not observed. In previous studies, the rate of detection had been shown to drop over the course of the day. The researchers suggested that other health care facilities might want to consider this model of breaking the day into three-hour shifts. Researchers in the U.K. showed that a diet high in foods containing oleic acid, such as olive and grapeseed oils, may protect against the development of ulcerative colitis. The researchers evaluated over 25,600 individuals between the ages of 40 and 74 years, recruited between 1993 and 1997. At the start of the study, none of the participants presented with ulcerative colitis. However, after a median follow-up of almost four years, 22 individuals had developed the disease, 45% were women. The researchers found that individuals with the highest intake of oleic acid were 90% less likely to develop ulcerative colitis. In a statement, the researchers said that oleic acid seems to work by blocking chemicals in the bowel that aggravate the inflammation found in ulcerative colitis. More research may be able to confirm whether oleic acid supplementation is a possible treatment for patients with ulcerative colitis and whether increasing dietary intake of oleic acid may have a protective effect. People who take aspirin regularly for at least a year may have a substantially increased risk of developing Crohn's disease. That was the finding of researchers in the United Kingdom. Researchers evaluated over 200,000 subjects between the ages of 30 and 74 who had been recruited for the European Prospective Investigation into Cancer. Median follow-up was 4.7 years. After follow-up, 62 participants developed Crohn's disease and 126 developed ulcerative colitis. The researchers found that regular intake of aspirin was linked to an increased risk of developing Crohn's disease with an odds ratio of 4.83. In non-smokers who took aspirin, the risk was greater, with an odds ratio of 5.92. But there was no effect in those who smoked and took aspirin. The odds ratio for this group was 0.41. The researchers also found no link between aspirin intake and ulcerative colitis. The presenters noted that aspirin does have many beneficial effects, including helping to prevent heart attacks and strokes. In a statement, the lead researcher urged aspirin users to continue taking aspirin. Since the risk of developing Crohn's disease is very low, only one in every 2,000 users, and the link between aspirin and Crohn's is not yet proven. The use of proton pump inhibitors for gastroesophageal reflux disease during pregnancy may be associated with cardiac birth defects, according to research presented at the meeting. Investigators used medical records from a United Kingdom general practitioner electronic medical record system called the Health Improvement Network to identify over 200,000 pregnancies in the United Kingdom between the years 2000 to 2008. The researchers identified nearly 2,400 cases of infant cardiac malformations and over 19,000 matched controls. The researchers found that the use of proton pump inhibitors during pregnancy was associated with a doubled risk of cardiac birth defects in newborns. Omeprazole was associated with the highest risk of cardiac birth defects compared to other proton pump inhibitors evaluated. The researchers determined that proton pump inhibitor use was not associated with an increased risk of birth defects in other organs. Investigators said in a statement that the lack of association between maternal use of proton pump inhibitors and birth defects in infants outside of cardiac birth defects makes it less likely that these findings are due to confounding factors. If these findings are confirmed, they may have direct clinical implications in the treatment of millions of women.
Research was presented which shed light on the practice of prescribing narcotics to treat patients with irritable bowel syndrome, despite their potential for harmful long-term effects. Researchers at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the International Foundation for Functional Gastrointestinal Disorders in Milwaukee surveyed nearly 1,800 adult patients with IBS who met Rome 3 criteria. They used an Internet-based questionnaire to assess demographic characteristics, clinical disease features, quality of life, psychological factors, health care use, overall satisfaction with disease management, and the medications patients currently used. The researchers found that about 18% of patients were undergoing treatment with narcotics. Patients more likely to use narcotics tended to experience more abdominal pain and IBS-related limitations. They also saw their own health as poorer and had a higher number of previous hospitalizations and surgeries. Patients in this study population who were currently using psychotropic or anti-acid medication were also more likely to use narcotics. In a statement, the lead author said that clinicians often lack the time, infrastructure, and incentives needed to provide integrative care to patients with chronic conditions like IBS. Narcotic prescriptions can be the path of least resistance, even though the long-term effects can be harmful. One author of this study disclosed receiving consulting fees as well as serving on advisory committees or review panels for various pharmaceutical companies. Last, a study looked at the adequacy of reporting cases of pediatric hepatitis C virus in the state of Florida. Researchers at the University of Miami and others compared the number of cases of hepatitis C in Florida for individuals under the age of 19, registered in the Merlin database between the years 2000 and 2008, with the number of expected cases based on the 3rd National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey and U.S. Census Bureau data. The researchers found only 1,755 cases of pediatric hepatitis C in Florida from 2000 to 2008. This was a substantially lower number of cases than expected, representing only 14.4% of the over 12,000 expected hepatitis C cases in the state through 2008. The researchers further estimated that no more than 8.5% of the identified pediatric HCV cases had undergone evaluation by a pediatric hepatologist. The data points to inadequate identification and suggests that the percentage of children receiving appropriate care for the condition is low. The authors of this study concluded that the under-identification of hepatitis C constitutes a critical public health problem in the state of Florida. The authors further wrote that although under-reporting of this infection is possible, the number of identified children with hepatitis C who are receiving appropriate medical care is unacceptably low. Thank you for listening to conference coverage from Digestive Disease Week 2010, which took place in New Orleans on May 1st through the 5th. Conference coverage is a presentation of ReachMD Radio, broadcast on XM160 and by live stream at ReachMD, and powered by Health Day.